Hi, everyone. Welcome to session 10D, Individual Papers Practices. I'm Caroline Kipp, and I'll be the session's moderator. Please feel free to enter your questions in the Q&A, and we'll address them at the end of the presentations. We'll begin with Kate Seculis presenting Men More, Buy Less, Repair Making as Activism, followed by Ineka Kai'i presenting Sitting Between My Mother's Legs, I Learned About the World, Sarah Joy Ford presenting Rebel Dykes and Arrowheads, Embroidering Lesbian Histories in the Pitt Rivers Museum History, Margarita Cular Barona presenting Stitches in Time Towards an Institutional Darning Based on Feminist Pedagogy and Textile Practices, and finally, Stephanie Bunn presenting Forces in Translation, The Hidden Story of Mathematics and Textile Skills. And with that, Kate, would you begin sharing your screen? Okay, hello. I'm so thrilled to be here. TSA, this has been the most amazing, impressive, inspiring symposium. Thank you, Caroline, for the intro. And I'm really thrilled to be kicking off this particular panel. I can't wait for you guys, Anika, Sarah Joy, Margarita, and Stephanie. They all sound fascinating. So let's get mine done. Okay, my subtitle, Repair Making, is a bit misleading because what I'm really presenting on today is the textile intervention known as visible mending. Not many years ago, nobody had heard of this, but now it's very trendy, which is a shame because trends pass. Though, on the other hand, in many ways, this is a practice with roots so deep that it transcends trend, as I will show. Repair making is the preferred term of a small group of practitioners who gathered at the Menders Symposium in Cumbria, England in 2012, a date which could be said to mark the foundation of a sort of movement. One of the Menders was Bridget Harvey, maker of the Mendmore Jumper Here, that was created as a placard for the 2015 London Climate March, and ironically for an icon of a practice that's all about wearability, was rendered all but unwearable in the process, though flexible enough to be mounted in the Fashion from Nature exhibition at the V&A. In her dissertation, Repair Making, Craft, Narratives, Activism, Dr. Harvey defined repair making as, quote, a craft of its own, implicitly and explicitly relating to activism. Repair making is social as well as material, a field of exciting actions, communities and politics, changing objects, mindsets and habits, close quote. Visible mending, I'll come to in a minute. First, disclosures. This is very much research in progress with a distinctly auto-ethnographic approach since I am involved with whatever movement may be said to exist. I've been practicing visible mending since long before it was named and will include some of my work here. My website visiblemending.com is about to relaunch. I Instagram at visible mend. My PhD subject is mending. And this here is my new book, Mend, a refashioning manual, a manifesto, not an academic work, but a trade book about, well, I hope it's obvious. It's the latest of several new books on the subject and there are more on the way. I said this is getting popular. Books tend to fall on the craft side of the practice with $100 mending kits available on Etsy. Political context is found more in social media, emphasis on the apparel industry, fast fashion or big fashion as I call it, with its planetary and human abuses more widely understood since the Rana Plaza factory collapsed on top of 3,600 workers seven years ago, and through the efforts of campaigning groups such as Fashion Revolution, the Clean Clothes campaign here, and the newer Pay Up Fashion, which demands restitution from the corporations that reneged on millions of dollars of bills when COVID hit. Now, although visible mending can and does interject in many political arenas, often through stitched slogans, by far its most consistent message, intrinsic to its form, is a protest against the planned obsolescence, corruption, and greed of mass brands. Wearing an obviously mended garment wordlessly protests the sweated labor and ecological disaster endemic to the industry that produced the garment. In short, it's anti-fashion industrial complex. There is a privileged position baked into that, which we will return to. You might say visible mending, which I might call VM from here on, is a consciously retrograde manipulation of dress that recasts a historical marker of poverty and domestic labor as activism. 
Now I'm going to lay out some of that historical mending background, outline what kind of textile intervention counts as repair making, and contextualize the practice as activism, mostly but not entirely in response to the parlous state of today's fashion industry. A VM isn't necessarily performed with any kind of activist intent, though the mended object might then participate in a political narrative with or without its consent. A VM is by definition wearable or dress related, but a dress related textile artwork created with activist intent is emphatically not usually a VM. Nobody would call Fabiola Jean Louis, Jean Louis's revolutionary dress or Alain Latka's Edima Pirano's presence, remembering a victim of the Argentinian hunter's death flights through her own sweater, unraveled and embroidered into her place of murder, wearable. Sometimes so-called art brute, created by people with alternative worldviews, perhaps from a carceral space or a place of pain and expressing a certain horror vacui, participates without its consent in an activist narrative, like these by Ikuyu Sakamoto, Agnes Richter and Dunja Hirsch de Koprolchek. These are wearable and can be a great inspiration to the visible mender, but they are not visible mending. Confusingly, this wearable textile art by Celia Pym is visible mending. It has been exhibited as craft and Pym has talked about her work in the context of fashion waste, but she self-identifies not as mender, craftsperson or activist, but artist, which hasn't saved this sweater from hundreds of hashtag visible mendings. So what is a visible mend then? It is a clothes intervention made to counter the ecological and ethical horrors of overconsumption by being obvious. A badge of honor stating this old thing was saved from the landfill. It's made for wearing and only for wearing. A scrappy home-based handmade art form, humble and quotidian, defiantly amateur, though this is changing, 98% female, non-scientific, and it has to be admitted so far overwhelmingly white. It is a revival art rescuing techniques such as the Swiss darn and the felled patch. It is in conversation with domestic laborers of past generations. And who were these menders of history? You haven't read that book? No, because mending has hardly been noticed by academics, which is odd since it's the commonest of all dress manipulations and surely the oldest. For most of history, since textiles were so costly, nearly all clothes were extremely mended with inevitable visibility, then worn to bits. A mend was never meant to be visible. An amend that shows has nearly always signaled shame. A mend is fashion's most hidden, subversive, transgressive aspect, a parasite that once seen negates the fashionability of its host. Amend is always caused by and is intimately fused with wear patterns, embodied, private. Its position and execution interrogate the relationship between wearer and garment, spatially and socially. Its symbolic value situated on the continuum from shameful to virtuous, depending on the culture, era and social status of stitcher and wearer. I've only half jokingly decided that at see the 5,000 year old Iceman's pants are the oldest extant example of mending, since they were found in 2016 to have been patched from 10 distinct pelts. And the first visible mend might be this blue kerchief poorly darned in white, belonging to no lesser personage than Tutankhamun. In Middleton, New Kingdom, Egypt, linen was literally money, so of course everything was mended and remnant ends like this thread nest would be interred with the body. Fabric was the principal currency. In the classical world, mending and tailoring were one and the same. When clothes were draped cloth, the outfitters in the Roman Empire Sarsena Torres were really darners and patches, as were the second-hand dealers, providers of most clothing, Greek Grutopoli, Roman Scrutari, and wool specialist the Collegia Centenariorum, Wherever there are preserved garments, there are accidental visible mends. The sheer volume of preservation stitching guarantees it. 
This eighth century child's wool tunic hemmed in two ply linen and darned in thick white wool looks almost hip to the modern eye. The much patched Coptic tunic fragment studied by archeologist Ines Bogensberger was less skillfully treated. Think of medieval textile and the mind might go to Opus Anglicanum, the opposite of mending, but mine goes to prosperous silk merchant Giovanni di Pietro di Bernardone, better known as St. Francis. This is one of three extant cowls patched with his own hands in five different woolen textiles, plus one more, better stitched, patched from the still surviving cape of St. Clair, who probably sewed it. Quote, all the brothers are to wear inexpensive clothing and they can use sackcloth and other material to mend it with God's blessing, end quote. That was St. Francis's dictum. The one reason we don't consider mending as intrinsic to the course of fashion is that holy relics, ecclesiastical, aristocratic and monarchical robes are all we ever see, but mending, refashioning, recycling is the hidden narrative behind the canonical hemline histories and court dress in collections. The ordinary and the very poor wore their few clothes out or to the grave, and it's only in genre painting or the odd documentarian Jacques Caillot, Peter Jans Kvast, or Rembrandt here, where we witness depictions of those. And of course, they skew too far to the literally picturesque poverty. However, it wasn't only the poorest of the poor who wore patched and darned clothes, but virtually everyone but those whose garments we see in museums. More clothes were acquired secondhand than new. Remodeling, remaking, and mending by way of artfully placed trim was how the majority got dressed. And of course, with 19th century industrialization and ready-mades came an inkling of the kind of exploitation that's now metastasized, with something new made in sweatshops of sewing women laboring over slop work, replacing mending. Everyone could recite Thomas Hood's 1843 Song of the Shirt, quote, a woman sat in unwomanly rags, plying her needle and thread, stitch, 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 in poverty, hunger and dirt, sewing at once with a double thread, a shroud as well as a shirt, end quote. These are all titles, Song of the Shirt, and there's many more, but it didn't make them darn. A similar situation applies now, but we outsource to sewing women we don't have to live with. And just to mention for the most infamous of mending eras, clothes rationing in World War II, where the British Board of Trade slogan, make do and mend, didn't know it would end up as a hashtag. Mrs. So-and-so gave children nightmares and the Nazi squanderbug encouraged unfettered shopping instead of mending. The US meanwhile, with no clothes rationing, had the less famous, use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without, Life magazine advocated visible mending, declaring patches are popular, brought into the open by war and conservation. Sadly, they didn't mean planetary conservation, but that of material for war material. And now a brief visit to the late 60s, early 70s, where the counterculture corollary to consumerism, the mended, patched, embellished hippie aesthetic briefly went mainstream leading to what the Times called a craft comeback. In 1971, home sewing was a $3 billion industry and Women's Wear Daily reported 80% of American teenage girls were active needleworkers. Anyway, with a growing interest in the narrative of dress, not to mention questions of production, ethics and reuse, perhaps more mended, accidentally visibly, pieces such as these will come to light and be treated as the treasures they are. French workwear um, said the sellers of the, oh, was it, certainly there's a fashion market for them, said the sellers of these 1930s French workwear pants, $1,400, all the holes and patches and stains are what make these valuable. Condition is worse than a wash rag, and that is what makes them cool. Cool is not good if we want to be able to preserve these rare dress objects and study the mend. The farm labourers' trousers, remarkably almost 300 years old, were collected by the visionary British scholar and curator Pamela Claben, as well as that other piece there, 
who championed the study of rural, provincial and lower class dress mid to late last century, way ahead of her time. Talking of appropriation, nothing has influenced VM visible mending as much as the Japanese textile traditions that grew out of the Edo era austerity and sumptuary laws in the rural north. Sashko or little stabs, running stitch in light colored thread on indigo dyed fabrics in symmetrical geometric patterns is influential, bora even more so. From bora bora meaning tattered, this is sashiko stitching upon scraps onto scraps on top of scraps to keep dress and household textile going for decades or even generations. Its patched appearance we find so attractive was once the source of shame, a reminder of poverty and lack. We cannot do bara, it belongs to history, and most of us can't do sashiko either. Yet denim's mended in the style of a probably the number one VM subcategory. And VM is a look that it takes some degree of privilege to enjoy. Anyone raised in poverty might reach for immaculate couture rather than this scruffy aesthetic. There's no doubt VM on Instagram, which is where let's not pretend otherwise it's currently living, is pretty white. But there is some hope this could change. With exquisite irony, mending is now the luxury which puts it out of reach of anyone short of time, not to mention clothes, but it's more often used to extend the mayfly lifespan of mass brand clothes within anyone's reach than performed on luxury goods. Mending is no pussy hat. Given its endemic humility and utility, it's not, in the words Julie Feelers used three years ago in her infamous open letter on medium, taking down the moribund craftivist movement, one of the most nonsensical white feminist privileged stances that actually works to silence people of color. This, men this visibly mended look is rapidly becoming the aspirational aesthetic for all people. This entire millennium fashion has fetishized the worn and embellished, incorporating imperfection, D de and reconstruction, patching and repurposing like Martin Margello, Junior Watanabe and Alexander McQueen here. And more recently, the insanely popular Luke's ragbag Gucci stylings of Alessandro Michele have mirrored the bricolage and random assemblages of VM. Greg Lauren, meanwhile, mirrors his uncle Ralph by not copying like him, but cutting and pasting actual army surplus into a reasonable, if overpriced, simulacrum of someone's home distressing. Which is what I did in reverse on the abomination that is mass distressed jeans, buying a couple of holy pairs from Forever 21, artfully mending them and returning them to the store. Is that activism? Is this? a sweater that's clearly beyond redemption, redeemed anyway. Or this dress rescued from a derelict farmhouse in upstate New York, cleaned and mended with appliques of, fashion, of fabric from the same hall. Or maybe this, because the opposite of hate is indeed mending. But what defines activism surely is not so much the intention as the effect it has and the audience it reaches. As stated earlier, a political message can be appended onto an innocently mended object. Equally, a deliberate statement like this can simply rattle around, trapped in its own social media bubble echo chamber. So one more statement to conclude. In a desperate redressing of my own white cis female, possibly performative social media allyship, and in real distress after the George Floyd, Breonna Taylor slayings, I started to hashtag so her name in response to Kimberly Crenshaw and the African American Policy Forum's Say Her Name campaign, mending a dress by embroidering names of black women slaughtered by cops. I know this isn't the work that's meant by do the work, but I'm doing this work till I figure out what that work is, I wrote. It struck quite a chord. To my surprise, I got a comment. Please sew her name. My cousin, a Tatiana Jefferson, killed by Fort Worth police in her own home. I stitched to Tatiana and told her story. And I was joined by Lisa, a young person identifying as black, queer, bipolar. She said, I'm a black waitress in a 98% white town. I've been embroidering the names of lost black women's lives on my work shirt uniforms. If a customer or my coworkers ask me about the name on my shirt, I will tell them who these women were and the injustice that killed them. Now that is activism. Repairing and making, I believe there is something about the symbolic act of mending that is humble and human and speaks softly but firmly and has truth in it. Or as Lisa wrote in Instagram, hashtag so her name, 
This is my way of giving an open invitation to start a conversation that might not otherwise be shared. Thank you. Um, up next is Anika Kai presenting Sitting Between My Mother's Legs, I Learned About the World. Thank you guys, everyone, for being here today. Thank you, TSA. Thank you, Caroline, and all the wonderful artists and scholars who are in my panel and everyone who I've been viewing. Thank you guys for being here. Um, my name is Anika Kai. I'm an Atlanta-based artist. Uh, my work explores the quotidian Black feminine identity, its complexities, and its reimaginings. And through material collage, minimalist practices, and performance, I interrogate spaces of questioning transitions, frameworks of being, and Black women quotidian. Okay, so between my mother's legs, I learned about the world. This is a picture of my mother's best friend, Sandy, doing my hair sometime in the early 90s. Oddly enough, with the title of this talk in paper, I don't have any images of my mother braiding my hair as a child. They exist now as embodied memory left to be told to you through oral utterances. I think of why those images don't exist within my family archives, much like the sparse archives of cultural beacons and institutions. Maybe the quotidian nature of this practice left little to be photographed or inquired. Maybe we never saw the urgency within our hands. Though my mother does not appear in the image, her presence rests in the perspective. My mother captured a moment. Her lens revealed an interior space that contained both intimacy and rebellion that exists among the lives of Black women, a self-making done in private. This was my introduction. If I didn't define myself for myself, I would be crunched into others' fantasies for me and eaten alive. I feel the urgency in Audre Lorde's words. This quote speaks to the cannibalism Black women face under the guise of Western imperialism and canonization. Lord is asserting the necessity for cultivating an image of self that exists outside the margins. Black hair is Black matter. Black hair, Black matter. A search for identity through haptic knowledges, Christiva's theory of abjection, I am abjected. Cast off the boat as other, I dangle by a thread. How do I evoke materiality of me when it is me? It just is. I was birthed into definition. My hair seemed to exist outside that language. As Audrey stated, I cannot look outside of me to define me. Textile study of objects. Textiles is a study of objects, techniques, and theories that inform physical objects or techniques that are associated with it. Through my studies, there was and is a lack of scholarship on Black people within material culture studies. This absence comes as no surprise knowing these institutions preface knowledge, knowledge systems and acquisitions of domination and exploitation. But within this absence, we can push for alternative methods of engagement. Black women's textile history creates access points that uproot fixed descriptions. We then ask questions of where to look, how to look, and who provides that authority. What is my definition of radical? My idea of radicalism is of the quotidian, an everyday mundane story of autonomy. When we engage with black hair practice of corn rolling through the theory of the black female radical, we formulate and recontextualize cultural textile practices in a U.S. context. Textiles making does not exist in a vacuum, so we must take into account the social political landscape in which these practices take place. Ephemerality provides an open for fluidity, an opening for fluidity. It is a theoretical framework, a state of being, Oxford definition of ephemeral, lasting a very short time. Lasting, what does it mean to last for a short time? It is my mother constantly repeating, I need your hair to last two weeks, so try not to scratch. Lasting is enduring or able to endure over a long period of time, to function well or to be in good condition, to survive, to endure. Lasting first came as a verb in action, a defiance. Through thinking, I discuss ephemerality through the sea, home, and visual design, claiming them as transitory markers of agency. I am an anthroarchaeological 
I'm on an antho archaeological pursuit for the material culture that is seen through the lens of blackness, a timeless material that carries with it an understanding of subjectivity. I'm looking for a space that sits in between the cave drawings of Algier and the sand dunes of Saturn moons Titan, where lines interweave to form complex transparencies. Consulting other mediums is necessary in developing a narrative around the black feminine. Remnants left of drawings, photographs, and literature, the possibilities. The Atlantic Ocean, a modern beginning for those suspended between two geographies. In the Poetics of Relations, French philosopher Edouard Glissant speaks to the identity through entry, errantry, a search of freedom within a particular surrounding, a desire that goes against the root, an act of wondering, the lackness contained within roots. He states using Deleuze's theory of the rhizome to go beyond the roots, to triumph the triumph in uprootedness. Rooted is opposed to the rhizome, an unmeshed system, a, a network spreading either in the ground or in the air. My movement is my root. Toni Morrison, all water is perfect memory and is forever trying to get back to where it was. If we begin with the side of the boat, movement becomes necessary entity that lingers in the air, that lingers in the air practices and manifest in and after this forced migration. One is not the reason for the other. I do not wish to overdetermine or generalize the complexity of this theory I'm trying to unpack. But these two images are of a similar cultural narrative and both lay claim to transitory. Both move through time, carrying with them ghosts of bodies who shared the space. How do I connect with the sea? Like an infinite depth, this piece unnamed hair rug began as an attempt at reclaiming and dominating white institutional spaces. As a side note, I consider all my works as attempts and subject to change based on further information. But unnamed hair rug, I've worked on since 2017 on and off. It's an ongoing piece, both a loving and a loathing. It is eight feet in diameter now, made of synthetic cankalon hair. The piece, like myself, has evolved over time as an exploration into ontological frameworks of the underground agency and with notions of opacity. I decided to activate the piece with my body in a performance called A Call for Grounding. I performed underneath the piece while stories of women connected to me pers personally played above, serving as a backdrop. This piece speaks to the notions of horizontality that pushes up against hierarchical notions of art and the norm, a refusal of verticality, uprightness, human at 90 degrees. This is similar to Fred Moten's theories of Betty, an enslaved woman who refused freedom. But is there freedom in imperialist domination? During the performance, I became consumed, swallowed by the physical abstraction, the rug, now a shroud, cloth, a cover. Cloth can be cut, worked, embellished, manipulated, and transformed. It is transported across continents to move just as the people who make and use it are on the move. As I perform, these women voices are the immaterial presence that appear and disappear, fleeting and fugitive, Sadia Hartman's whispers of the fugitive body. Black home is black communion. Black home is a space of contention. If we look to history's poor housing practices, gentrification, redlining, intimidation, and police brutality, black home function as a fugitive criminal space, the hyper surveillance and accessibility. But these black homes provide the landscape for an urgency that is placed within the practice of corn rowing. Black hair was and is creating agency in the everyday, a public, a private. This image taken by Gordon Parks touches home for me because I remember gathering on the porch, public living. It is a living out loud amidst the racial, amidst the racial oppressions that reside on the immediate. The practice of corn rolling taking outside of home presents another layer in defining textiles within a black feminine. Black women's bodies throughout history have been undermined, exposed, and overly surveilled. Spaces like steps, the stairs, and the porch are physical occurrences of public protest. To live out loud, this gesture of public living is in a state of opposition to the dominant narrative. Gathering space that is a silent shouting of, hell no, we won't go. 
I love this meme of Allen Iverson and his mother because it centers her as the rebel. Iverson's career was stigmatized by his choice of clothing and hairstyle, often cited as being overly aggressive or arrogant. But in this moment, it was her presence, her action of tidying up a braid that caused a rupture, a break, a disruption in the realm of respectability. No one was realer. She took the private public. Uh, this is an image of a series of works that I've been doing um, around Atlanta that are public protest in light of the police brutality against Breonna Taylor um, and just the erecting of monuments. So this one is titled O2 to the Rocks They Threw. I'm a Black woman artist and where I go and where I find and what I find there is through me, not outside of myself. For being a street northwest, Dixie Hills was a housing complex that I stayed for a year of my life. Now left condemned in a backdrop for those who reside near that space, I think about the legacy of those buildings, its burnt ruins, the smell that lingers in its bare walls and open ceilings. Did they burn it down? I think of those children who play at the street park situated next to the buildings. Three of them came to watch. I don't need to know what they got from it, just that they saw. They saw two black women who lived there together return. My mother and my mother and I grew there. I, I've never been ashamed of where I come from or who I am. I value the complications of these spaces, the people, and their stories. That is their potency. Bell hooks, home place, a safe space where Black people could affirm one another by doing so, heal the wounds inflicted by racist domination. The interior spaces of Black homes, even though complicated within cultural norms of patriarchy, provide Black women with spaces of kinship and belonging. The kitchen, the bedroom, the living room were sites of indoor loving. These spatial enclosures within the space and between my mother's leg performed an architectural layering of home space and place. Corn rowing is an intimate care work, houses moments of stillness and security exchanging the power amongst black women. Touching someone's hair is a privilege. The history of a, of a politicized black feminine body. Don't touch my hair. I shall not be petted or hexed. Old proverbs speak of bad energies of those who touch your hair with negativity. But cornrows are evidence of touch and evidence of effort and evidence of a know-how, says Jackson. Uh, article in uh, the Washington Post. Evidence of black labor of women, uh, evidence of labor of black women. It is not just something you can go to the store and buy. It is a craft. The corporal is called upon again. We touch is the way knowledge is transcribed. Language is always at fault when trying to describe the illegible, what can language become when seen through other forms of knowledge-based practices? Many cultures throughout the world, specifically indigenous people, believe in knowledge system outside the written intellect. These involve stories, dance, communication, and care. And we were nappy girls, quick as cuttlefish, scurrying for cover, trying to speak, trying to speak, trying to speak that pain. It is important for me in my practice to understand identity through familiar history. Most often these gestures of creating archives. I spoke to my mother of her connection to the cornrow. When asked about her design choices, she said, it made me remember how creative I was. I always did something different in your hair, a design, a way to be creative. Forms of exchange and dialogue, nonverbal language communication through its processes, through improvisational nature. Looking towards hair posters and drawings, we think of other modes of language, oral histories surrounding corn rowing. Afro Colombian Zamara Esperella Garcia, a woman who braids um, for. She does a lot of work in uh, the Smithsonian and speaks to uh, oral histories. And so in Colombia, she said that hair braiding was used to relay messages. The signal that they wanted to escape, women would braid a hairstyle called departes, 
It had thick type braids closely to the scalp and would be tied in buns on top. Another style, curved braids, tightly braided on the head. It would represent the roads that were used to escape. What do we do with this knowledge? This is an image of a mother who was corn rolling her daughter's hair. That this practice was a practice used by Maroonian women during escaping colonialism and enslaved peoples. We have heard her word and rely on her demonstration to reveal these stories. She holds these stories to reveal. She holds these stories to reveal. When we search for legitimacy within dominant institutional structures, we are never fully able to explore the length and depth of a practice because those methods of work and research are based on colonization and anti-Blackness, where conquering and hoarding and exploitation are the foundation. I value skepticism as a way of reimagining and framing clues left by archives and objects hidden in dark spaces of collections or objects that have passed away like most Black spaces that are only left through documentation. Corn rolling is one of the practice that questions knowledges, history, and futures of Black material. It forces us to believe Black women. What was left? This was a piece I created in the Reworking Labor Exhibition at SAIC in September 2019. What we are left to contend with was the silence, never the process, but the complete form, the absence of hand, the refusal in opaque starkness, an out of place space. Where the upseared body is up for display, they protrude off the wall. The hand is revealed when asked to come close to view its materiality. What was left was my attempt to conceal what makes apparent absence and cultural tokenism. These Bantu vessels protrude from the white walls of the institution. They are oddities in and out of place. Future modalities, haptic dialogues, and, aptic, and abject technologies. So these are uh, kind of my sketches and where my work is going now in relation to technology braiding and how these um, inform each other. So intersections of the body and technology, how we engage with automation. The new work I'm exploring thinks about the body as a simultaneous, as simultaneously interacting with the technological world. Theories of black feminism and disability studies run sync with opposing forced abjection and criminalization. When algorithms and digital futures are led by wealthy white men, I wonder where do I and other black women sit in the Google search engines or the imaginations of those who build these engines. I hold fast to elements that will connect me to a physical self, an embodiment that still lingers within the sensorial. Sometime something grew out of me. This is a collage piece that I've been working with using the body and elements of hair and technical components. Sasha Bonet says, collaging is a historical practice of the black imagination. It helps conceive, it helps us envision unfathomable futures and face violence and uncertainty, a creative way to love each other even though we haven't been shown care to express the depths of our experience, even though when no one ever asked how we felt, we give evidence to all those things unseen. Collaging serves as a visual reputation of Black quotidian life. It deconstructed and internalized white supremacist stereotypes of Blackness, providing momentum and civil rights movement. Black hair is black matter, a search for identity through haptic knowledges. Christiva's theory of abjection, I am abjected, cast off the boat as other. I dangle by a thread. How do I evoke materiality of me when it is me? It just is. I was birthed into definition. My hair seemed to exist outside of that language. As Audrey stated, I cannot look outside of me to define me. Thank you. Up next, we have Sarah Joy Ford presenting Rebel Dykes and Arrowheads, Embroidering Lesbian Histories in the Pitt Rivers Museum History. Thank you. Um, 
And thank you TSA for having me. And it's lovely to be here with all the panelists as well. Um, so uh, today I'm gonna talk about a quilt that I was commissioned to make uh, for the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford as part of their Beyond the Binary project in 2019. The project works with members of LGBTQ plus communities to create, commission and acquisition objects for the museum that tell queer stories and queer histories. The quilt I created draws on archival research, both at the Pitt Rivers Museum and the personal collection of Fish, also known as King Frankie Sinatra, a drag king, club night host and partner in the Rebel Dykes history and film project. Nightclub flyers, mud wrestling, cats wrapped up in thread, witches knots, labrys tattoos, and dyke poster and flyer designs are pulled into stitched entanglement. Through my process of making, I will reflect on the power of embroidery as a methodology for materialising lesbian cultures and stories where they've previously been hidden. Lesbianism has never been legislated against in the UK. And in 1921, when an amendment to the Criminal Law Amendment Act of 1885 was proposed to include acts of gross indecency between women, it was not passed, not due to tolerance, but as an act of erasure, fearing that the very mention of sexual acts between women in law might cause the spread of the practice further. This reaffirmed lesbian sexuality as a silent sin. Women were punished in other ways. It has also resulted in a lack of tangible records. As in Terry Castle's words, the lesbian became a jurisdictional phantom, ghosted by the system. Now lesbian material continues to be difficult to come by in museums as a result of homophobic and sexist practices. Obscured, erased and censored, embroidery can offer a subversive strategy for stitching, embellishing and reassembling queer women's histories into the quilt and into the museum. Embroidery is the process of adding thread, designs or embellishment to the surface of fabric, but it is, can also be the process of adding fictitious or exaggerated details to a story. My work embraces this dual nature of embroidery and its potential for adding to and adding in the details of lesbian history that are so often missing from museums. This process of institutional embellishment draws on the powerful potential and duality of the needle in its ability to both pierce and stitch together, penetrate and repair. Today I will share some of my processes in making the work, its relationship to my wider practice and my PhD research and explore my processes of entangling different kinds of archives. Elements of this paper are still half formed thought and others draw on my forthcoming article for psychoanalysis culture and society's special edition on trauma and the museum so you can find out more there if you're interested next year hopefully um, so the Pitt Rivers Museum was established in the 1884s annexed it's annexed on the back of the Natural History Museum um, and houses the anthropological and archaeological collections belonging to the University of Oxford mostly gifted collections from Augustus Henry Lane Fox Pitt Rivers. Many of the objects are what we might call wounded artifacts, obtained with violent or coercive tactics from indigenous communities by colonial anthropologists, missionaries and administrators. These objects have been displayed in a manner which perpetuate colonial mythologies of people of colour as primitive or savage. However, the Pitt Rivers is going through a long-term project to consult with communities from which the objects were taken to repatriate, put into storage, or recurate displays to acknowledge and repair the damage done by colonial museum practices. The Beyond the Binary project builds on the previous Out in Oxford LGBTQ plus museums trail and is funded through the Heritage Lottery Fund. The project states its aim as to collaborate and co-create with LGBTQ plus communities to recognise the silences and limitations of the museum. The project has worked with community curators to acquisition new objects important to communities, as well as commissioning five artists to make new works for an exhibition and the permanent collection. So the commission came while I was one year into my practice-based PhD that examines quilting as a methodology for revisioning lesbian archival materials Mostly I've been working with feminist archives that have collections that are already identified as lesbian, including Glasgow Women's Library, the Women's Library at LFC, and the Rebel Dykes Archive, as well as the personal collections of living lesbians. This work is a shifting focus across the 20th century from suffrage to the sex wars. 
And the commission came as a challenge and a real shift in exploring existing collections that were already identified as lesbian into what called for a queering of the museum. In this case, I decided to bring my own le lesbian objects with me into the museum. Using a practice-based process of transforming museum objects through stitch, I would pull them into the lesbian lexicon of the quilt, into conversation with the rebellious histories that my PhD considers and cares for. As part of the quilt, these objects might gather new meanings and associations through proximity to lesbian cultures and histories. As I'm sure this particular audience will know, uh, the quilt is a blanket made up of three layers stitched together and with trapped air creating warmth. Quilts are often conflated with patchwork, which is a common technique of cutting small pieces of fabric and reassembling them into a whole cloth. However, there are multitudes of quilt making methods. My quilts draw on the traditions of whole cloth, eider downs, faux patchwork, narrative album quilts, uh, rather than physically patchworking together in most cases. Um, as well, there's a little bit of patchworking in this one, but that's about as, as far as I go, really. <laughs> Um, although my quilts don't often use physical patchworking, the thrifty strategy of patchwork informs my methodology. Gathering images from mismatched repositories in the face of scarcity and the erasure of lesbian histories from institutional spaces, this works as an apt and canny strategy. Traditionally, quilts have told women's stories, sustained friendships through quilting bees and friendship quilts, as well as documenting the milestones of heteronormative lives life chronologies, births, marriages, and deaths. And during the 70s and 80s, feminist artists and art historians, including Rosika Parker, Lucy Lippard, and Janice Jeffries, acknowledged that women had been stitching their stories of their lives as a source of pleasure and painful recollection, using this as a weapon against the constraints of femininity. My own digitally embroidered quilt practice speaks to the pain and pleasure and rebellious histories erotic activisms and unruly desires of lesbian cultures. The first instances of patchworking were repairs, um, covering wounds in fabrics with new kinds of cloth. Quilts cover and protect, they are a strategy for survival. This drive towards repair is also deeply embedded in the work of doing lesbian history through recovering and reclaiming as an undoing of histories of injury, erasure and homophobic trauma. Faced with queer spectatorship, as Heather Love defines it, as the isolated and uninformed viewing of negative images of homosexuality, the quilt offers a space to work through the textures of silence and lack in the museum. This quilted form and its process of collecting, recollecting and reassembly reference these acts of salvage and the necessary work of reconstructing the past. Within each stitch, the needle both penetrates and unites, holding both the psychological and physical symbolism of the device and its magical power to restore and repair in the material and the psychic. This reparative power of stitch opens up the possibility for joining edges materially, imaginatively or symbolically drawing new connections and suturing gaps. So it was important for me to draw in some of the unconventional and undocumented materials I had been working with into the museum, in particular, my work with the Rebel Dykes and uh, a Rebel Dykes partner, Fish. The group Rebel Dykes works to collect and protect the recent histories of queer communities in the UK. The Rebel Dykes film project documents the lives of Dyke communities in London in the 80s and 90s and very hopefully will be released in 2021. It's been a long process. The project has had a difficult journey. When Siobhan Fahey was establishing the Rebel Dykes history project as a community interest company with Company House, the initial application was rejected as the word Dyke may be considered offensive. A successful community petition challenged this, stating how communities have reclaimed the word that was previously an insult into a word of belonging, inclusivity and pleasure. The erasure of the word dyke is written into this presentation. As I dictated on Microsoft Word, I was surprised to find dyke replaced with a series of asterisks, leaving instead a gap of black marks, an obscuring of history and my identity built into this software. My quilts operate in this 
asterisked space, undoing erasure, reclaiming lost worlds, and stitching together the stories and sensations of being part of a marginalized community. I met Fish in 2018 when attending a Rebel Dyke walking tour in Brixton with my mother. I was captivated by her and her stories of 80s dyke antics. As she marched around the streets with us in tow, she would stop and pull out magazines and ephemera from her tote bag and the front of her trousers and hand them around the audience to look at, including copies of the squatter's zine, crowbar and shebang magazine. When she said that she had a, a garage full of stuff, I was beyond excited. At the end of the tour, I plucked up the courage to talk to her and tell her about my work. She invited me to her house and that was the start of our friendship. Pictured here on her beloved, beloved motorbike, Fish is a diligent auto-archivist, collecting the ephemera of her extraordinary life. Her collection documents a life filled with love, sex, activism, as a drag king, club host, black widow, romantic bone, and rebel dyke. Piles of photographs, flyers, and clippings from the nights she was involved in, and still is, including um, Chain Reaction in London, which was the UK's first S&M dyke club, which ran from... Um, 1987 to 1990. Fish has been so generous in sharing her life and intimate histories with me over the years. In exchange, I have helped her organise her massive collection with what we called our own dyke archiving method, which included organising chronologies by girlfriend. Um, here are some photos from a very intense three days just before lockdown. Um, she hid a thank you card in my handbag when I went to the toilet. Through the process of embroidery, I wanted to be able to honour these hidden fragments of a life, bringing snippets of the stories and sensations of a radical dyke life into the institutional museum. I, when I went on a research trip to the Pitt Rivers, I was overwhelmed by the stacks of cabinets, glass boxes and weapons lining the ceiling. There was just so much stuff and I wasn't sure how to make sense of it, especially in relation to the Rebel Dykes research. Wandering around, among the cabinets, I was intrigued by the axes, flints, clubs and arrowheads, beautiful objects laden with symbolic violence in their actual intended or reference use and in the violence of their journey into the museums as, cap as captives of white colonialism. I especially like the arrowheads, all lined up like sweets under the glass, little paper labels, ink pens laid by their sides, some with numbers scrawled on their surfaces. I thought of other kinds of arrows, the prison arrows crawling up the skirts of the suffragettes mounted on pikes and marched alongside sewn banners in through the street. The arrow, a thicker kind of needle, reclaimed as a warning. I thought too of the iconographies of puncture and resistance in lesbian culture. The double-headed axe, or the labrys, is a repeated motif in lesbian culture and consequently my own art practice. This bilateral symbol has a rich history of references associated with the Geminis as a symbol of equality, the ox or minotaur in Cretan legend, Hippolyta, and also with the mother goddess. Over time, the Labrys has also slipped into legend as lesbian legend as a tool of the Amazons and a symbol for lesbian strength. The radical feminist Mary Daly rejected the Labrys as a static symbol and reframed it as a transforming action, a tool for women to cut through the mazes of man-made mystification. The Labrys is also tattooed on Fish's arm, marking her out as a dyke. Leafing through the decades of photographs, the Labrys grows, Celtic bands wrap and encircle it, creeping down her arm with the years. It is a tool for recognition, a symbol of ferocity and resistance, a knowing wing. And um, so this is um, one of my embroidery of her tattoo. Later, I wondered which of these arrows are real and which are copies. Could they be forgeries like those of Flint Jacks? Many of Edward Simpson's carefully counterfeited artifacts ended up in museum collections and in 2009 were curated in an exhibition by Sean Lynch at the Henry Moore Institute for Leeds International Sculpture Festival. The arrowheads under the glass could be an embroidery of the truth. The arrowhead became a key motif in the quilt and in, in my continuing practice. Lining the border of the quilt, as you can see here next to the labrys, it became a tool, a container for memory, a signifier of the fabricated nature of all histories and a tool for reconstructing new lesbian narratives in museum spaces. The quilt is my own institutional forgery, an invited interloper. 
I don't tend to use complex time consuming piecing or patchwork when creating my quilts. Instead, I invest my time in embroidery and embellishment with a particular specialism in digital embroidery. The process of embroidering is that of adding threads, designs or embellishment to the surface of a fabric. It is a decorative practice, sometimes associated with the unnecessary and excessive, obsessive domestic femininities. It is ornamental rather than substantial, excessive rather than functional. As Julia Skelly puts it, embroidery holds traditional connotations of effeminacy and decadence, as well as implications of the everyday and the domestic sphere of social life presided over by women. Embroidery offers a strategy for subverting and reclaiming queer women's histories and telling them with explicitly gendered pleasure and pain. Embroidery can also be the adding of fictitious or exaggerated details to a story. This quilt offers me a creative space for the retelling of histories and the adding in or imagining what is missing. The lines become blurred and the stitches connect as snippets of Revel Dyke histories are embroidered into the Pitt Rivers Museum. The synthetic thread jumps out and sinks in, undulating the satin surface. The quilt demands a looking closer and the audience to work at untangling the images. It gives no straight answers. Out of time and out of order, the symbols and images swell, gesturing towards a different way of telling hidden stories, reconstructed and rearranged in stitch. This ornamental strategy privileges the pleasures and sensations of connecting and uncovering lesbian histories, rather than museum imperatives of communicating clear narratives or chronologies. My practice is an obsessive one. I am creating my own archive, retelling histories from a generation on looking back, reconstructing and embroidering a history still in the making. With every stitch, I am making myself at home in the history of my community. Since completing the commission, I've made some new works extending the project. The, uh, the, uh, it's a, a triptych of new works which explore the arrowheads further. Each one in the series represents a hand illustrated flyer from the Chain Reaction nightclub. And part of this process has been trying to track down the original illustrators uh, from the flyers online through the Rebel Dykes community. The series of numbers and letters on the arrowheads mimic those on the arrowheads in the museum. Referencing the information present on the flyers, also just inventing it when it wasn't there. It felt important to return to these arrowheads in more detail and to mark and materialize these moments in lesbian history. And that arrowheads will continue to appear again in a large scale quilt that I am currently making for the Rebel Dykes archive exhibition, which will be in 2021. Um, the exhibition, so this is some images from my uh, new some sampling from my new big quilt. Um, the exhibition will show archive materials alongside artworks from original Rebel Dykes, as well as a small selection of contemporary artists who've been inspired by the Rebel Dykes. So return to the museum, the quilt is now in the permanent collection. It has been frozen, sterilized, photographed and catalogued. Presently in suspension, like pretty much everything else at the moment. Eventually it will be displayed as part of the Beyond the Binary exhibition in 2021, opening up the possibility for new kinds of queer encounters and moments of recognition and pleasure with lesbian histories in an unexpected museum. Thank you. Up next, we have Margarita Kular Barona presenting Stitches in Time towards an institutional darning based on feminist pedagogy and textile practices. Um, so I will be presenting from Colombia, South America, where I live. And although there are many beautiful things about living here, having an internet, a stable internet connection is not one of them. So I'm hoping that I don't have to, you know, leave you suddenly. But if I do, I apologize in advance. Also, I have two kids, four dogs and a couple of chickens. So I hope that the sound that they make. I've spoken with the chickens and they're okay about not making any sounds or noises. I'm not so sure about my daughter, so I apologize as well in advance, if anything, if the noise interrupts my presentation. Um, so today I'm presenting um, some work that we've done at ICES University in Cali, Colombia with my colleagues who are not presenting with me today, but who are, you know, with whom I have organized this presentation. Aurora Vergara Figueroa is a sociologist. She runs the Center for uh, from Afro-Diasporic Studies. 
a Maria Paola Herrera is a industrial designer. I myself come from a literary background and um, film studies. Uh, we're going to present a series of projects that articulate um, feminist pedagogy, textile practice, uh, practices, singing, songwriting, and social gathering in the form of sewing groups as acts of resistance against the dynamic of loss and change that characterize a country that suffers from violence like our own. Um, we've, we've, um, these projects have taken place mostly in Cali, Colombia, where we live, but also in Bojaya, Choco, a region um, in the Pacific coast of Colombia that's mostly black, impoverished, um, it's beautiful jungle. Um, and we have worked with, with communities and art, art practitioners, art practitioners, and we're presenting mostly the methodology of the work we've done. Here are some examples of the work we've conducted in the past, uh, but we have more projects. So I'm, I'm going to present just a few of them. Um, our, our projects explore um, um, textile practices and co-designing processes and singing and songwriting as acts of, resi of resistance and repositories of collective memory that enable the reconstruction of social fabric. And we highlight the creative process of such projects also because we want to um, question the normative um, of results imposed by academic uh, research, um, but mostly um, sort of asks us to write papers as, as you know, a form of, of producing knowledge. So basically to ask a question of what we understand as knowledge. Um, so for these um, for these research, and I, I must say that we didn't begin, did this day, these didn't start at the center. We didn't start um, by doing these projects together. However, we all take place, take part in a seminar of feminist pedagogy. And we understood that um, most of our projects were connected in many, way, in many ways. Um, so this is where we found that we were sort of by following an intuition and that we found um, by reading Patricia Hill Collins, um, a lot of, we reflected on, on her work. And we um, were operating basically by, by uh, following some principles of black feminist epistemology, um, which is reclaiming the importance of lived experiences as a source, as a source of knowledge. Um, therefore, a connecting um, with knowers that might help us in our process, whether it's a le learning, healing, or understanding. Enabling a space for dialogue, as opposed to an adversarial debate, allowing a space in which we listen to one another. Also establishing solid channels, particularly while working with communities that have suffered from violence. Um, these communities are basically are very tired of having people come over, um, be with them, and then as soon as their work is over, abandon them. So, you know, establishing ongoing dialogues with these communities, particularly in the case of Aurora, who works with Choco. Um, Centering dialogue and live experience imply that knowledge is built around the ethics of caring and also trying to create safe spaces. This is a concept that Patricia Hill Collins um, uh, discusses in which um, she discusses how, how black communities, especially women, um, would create safe spaces in which to share stories. And we understand that some of these spaces in which women are, are gathered for, to, for sewing, sewing together, I believe that the quilting bees have some of that um, idea, uh, are safe spaces. So these safe spaces in which we can, we can talk about our, how, how we feel. And uh, personal accountability, basically being responsible for others, uh, becoming socially responsible and having a political agenda. And setting an example uh, by your lived experience of what you want to um, write about. Um, so the first of the projects that we, that, that we want to present here is the Sewing and Reading Club. Um, it's a project that is now taking place in a museum. It began at the university, but now it moved to a museum. 
in which we gather uh, every Friday to read pieces out loud and embroider or create different projects. Particularly here in this photograph, we are, are embroidering the names of social leaders that have been murdered in Colombia for the past, oh, it's been ongoing, but it's been happening more and more often in the past two years. Um, we select the text to read according to the projects, and we thought it would be very important to be reading the works of, of Black female writers in Colombia, given that people don't read much here. They read women in much less quantities. And, and if they read, don't read women, they, they don't read Black female poets. In this case, the poet Mari Grueso is the one that we invited her to read her own poetry. These are um, a few examples of the pieces that we were that we were embroidering. Uh, it was a, it was not it's not our project, but we took on the project. Uh, it was a colleague of ours who lives in Medellin. She was embroidering the names of these um, leaders murdered in 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 red um, thread over um, over white handkerchiefs. The next of our projects is called a colcha de retazos in Spanish. When you um, a quilt. Um, it's called the colcha de retazos. Retazos are scraps, so it's basically it's um, it's um, it's a quilt from scraps. Um, and this project is called a quilt from stories. Colcha de relatos. Relatos are stories. And what this, the first one we did uh, was a, on the eighth of March on. Um, 2017. As you recall, there was a call for stopping. Women were called for stopping on that day, um, sort of to call attention to all the work of care that we do that goes unnoticed. And we thought that if we all stayed and stopped and we stayed in our homes, uh, probably the world would collapse, yes, but most likely they wouldn't really see um, other forms of, of, of production uh, or how our work is so invisible. So we were wanted to, to make it more visible. So what we did was we took over a place in the university uh, below where the president's office is. And we, you know, basically we, we threw around um, scraps of, of, of cloth and sewing machines and we invited people to, to stop over and sit down and embroider with us wanted to make a quilt uh, that had embroidered pieces in each piece. Um, and after people were uh, after people were invited to join another, to go to a, a recording booth and tell the story of how they felt um, while gathering around and, and sewing and embroidering together. And they're very, very powerful stories about, about um, people who were, for example, there was a woman, a young girl, a student, who was embroidering her parents, both her parents' name together in the same um, scrap. And her parents were going through a divorce, so it was very painful for her, and she was embroidering both um, their names together. And there was also a young man who had no idea how to embroider, but when he was sitting down with us, he remembered that when he was a young boy, his uh, grandmother, when there was shooting around the area where he lived, it was a very violent area, his grandmother would put all of them under the bed. And in order to calm herself down, she would take her knitting or, or her embroidery or whatever she was doing. So it was a moment for him of transporting transporting him to another moment that connected him with his grandmother, but also connected him with a, with a, with a way of healing. Um, the second of our projects I want to present today is a very powerful project that Aurora led in Bojaja Choco. Bojaja is a very uh, impoverished area that suffered a incredible violence when um, there was cross shooting between several armed forces and some people were um, sheltering in a um, in a church and unfortunately a bomb the church was bombed and so uh, there was a lot of most of the community died there and this happened 15 years ago and still the community is asking for for some sort of, of recognition of their loss. Um, these women are mostly women, but this group of people were starting to song, to, to write songs that would tell their stories as a way of, of remembering what happened. So Aurora and her team of psychologists, anthropologists, um, 
sociologists, you know, went to the to the region. They've been doing work since uh, in the in the area, and were going to record, uh, make a record because this is what the community wanted. They wanted to make a record and make sure that their music was going to be heard. So Maria Paola, which is a designer, she was she went about um, designing the clothes, the clothing, because they were very concerned about how they were going to present themselves on stage. And uh, it was an interesting process in which Maria Paola did several workshops. And the first one of them was she asked them, she invited them to, to create a doll um, that's called The Best of Us. And she didn't go about teaching them how to make the doll. She just gave them materials and they started to, to make their own dolls. And she asked them uh, to put in those dolls the best of themselves. Um, and then a series of other workshops and she started to, and she, in, in which she asked them to, to, to draw uh, whatever they found most dear about their area, about where they lived. And in the end, she, um, what she came up with was with some drawings and, and um, with those drawings, she created the material that those those um, that that material that you see there, the cloth that is on the top part of the, of the dress, is is based on drawings that they themselves made, and uh, then the dresses as well. They were co-created with the community. Um, then uh, there's another this other project called Remendando Afectos, which basically it's a mending feelings, um, and we did it uh, again in in Cali in within the the reading and sewing club, and what we were doing is we were trying to. Um, understand how women feel towards their houses, how women feel towards having the load of the of the care work in the house. So what we did was we selected um, some texts that would that would question or narrate or 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 you know enlight uh, some fiction about or talk about um, how women. Um, are in the house or, or and and by this we wanted to sort of um give a way for people to talk about themselves so we didn't want to come with questions about how do you feel about doing all the care work in your house no we, so we just we just read pieces in which women were talking about um the load of work or we're just simply talking about discussing about a moment in in, in their in their intimacy and uh, we were discussing about how we could um, perhaps give a form to what was going on here. And we did a series of workshops, we did a series of, of pieces, but in the end, what resulted was this, this huge um, embroider piece in which uh, we decided we were going to uh, embroider our own names, the names of those we found very dear, and the names of the women we were reading out loud. Um, as well, I invited some uh, some music music uh, production students. That music is a mostly male dominated um, a program, particularly in our university, and asked them if they could come and record our our talking. And we were asking to record um, some of us as reading out loud. And then they made a piece that holds um, together the sounds of of our group sewing together and of those reading out loud. And the last project I want to present is, um, is, is a class, is a, is a class that I have that is called the Subversive Needle based on, on Rosica Parker's Subversive Stitch. And what I try to do here is try to integrate, um, to question the, the ideal feminine um, construction and the role um, and the sort of the separation between art and craft. And I do so by doing several things. The one thing I ask them to bring their bodies into the classroom by learning to knit, embroider, saw, you know, several different different practices, whatever they choose. The second thing I ask them to do is each week, I, I give them a, sort of a question they have to answer as a, as a sort of a journal. And by doing so, I am asking them, for example, to follow up or to understand a, how, how much do they mend their clothes? How, how if, if, they, if they mend their clothes, if somebody else mends their clothes for them, um, if there's somebody in the family who, who has the habit of, or the practice of, of embroidering knitting. And, you know, it was very curious because the first time I gave the class, I asked um, if anybody, if they knew any family people who had 
who had these practices. And I guess only five or six students raised their hand. Um, by, but by the end of the semester, what I found was that most of, more than half of the class had a grandmother or a great grandmother who had in fact um, was able to raise her family by sewing. And all these stories were made invisible to them either because they were not considered important or either because they were not curious enough to find out about their mothers and their legacies. So what I'm curious about here is also how these stories at first are made invisible, um, but also but by them comparing themselves against uh, what their mothers or grandmothers were able to have, the, the kind of life they were able to lead. Um, I was also you know, making them aware of, of what feminism has allowed us uh, women, the chances and the opportunities that it opens us as women. Um, I ask them in the second paper, in the first paper they have to make, I ask them um, to do a research on, on one of the women's in their lives. And this connects them to those, to those stories um, more intricately. The, for, the, for the last piece of, of work that we do in the classroom, a, I ask them to make a textile, to make, to design, to make, to build something. And there are beautiful stories. I would like to share just two of them with you. Um, there was one student that was very, um, he wasn't really engaging in class. He was just going there because he, I guess he had to take the class. Um, and by the end of the semester, he built a scarf. And I, while I was thinking of the relationship between text and textile that Margaret Atwood and many, many scholars um, have addressed, I think about his example of, or the metaphor he constructed by of, of this relationship. He um, he started knitting a scarf with his grandmother. So the first part of the of the scarf is very beautiful, is very proper, is very together. But in the process, his grandmother got sick, and his grandmother died during the during the term. So you see how the the scarf goes from being very beautiful, very tidy, to being very untidy, very messy, because this is when her grandmother had passed away and, and, and died. And then the scarf progressively gets more beautiful. So what the student sees in the end is this is this is the story of my grandmother and me. At first he was she was mending or doing the scarf for me, then I had to face it on my own. And this is now what the result of it. So basically the scarf was in the end, the story of the relationship. Then this girl here, Maria Paula, she didn't know what to make uh, at the end of the semester, but, um, but then she decided she wanted to make a, a rug uh, because, and then when she presented her work, she was saying, I needed to make, a, I wanted to make something that was practical. So I decided to make a rug for my bedroom. And now what I'm thinking is that every time I wake up in the morning, um, before I used to put my feet on the cold ground. And now when I wake up in the morning, I'm going to put my feet on, in this rug and just to know that I am no longer the same woman. I am a woman who's standing on the feminist knowledge and a woman who, under, who is seeing herself as a, as a, as a, as a, a feminist person. Um, so I've learned a lot about, I've learned a lot from my students and and um, talking about the personal accountability, going back to the first, um, the black epistemology um, learnings we have from, from Patricia Hill Collins. I'm thinking about the, in our classroom, in my classroom, I'm also making the students responsible for their own knowledge. I'm trying to transfer that responsibility. It's not just mine to give the class, but it's them to engage and, and, and give meaning to what they're, what they're doing. And the last of the projects I want to present today is me thinking about these ways of producing knowledge and academic papers that tend to be sometimes very excluding or exclusive, leaving people behind who don't read necessarily the academic language, especially gender studies language, or that are tend, tends to be very, very academic and not engage other audiences. We, um, I also run a magazine and we created a number in which we ask people to send contributions. And there's a lovely selection of, of contributions for from various different people here as the magazine. Um, there's contributions from Argentina who, who are, that, that photograph in particular there is people who are embroidering um, the faces of people who were disappeared in dictatorship. This is, this is a, a, a um, 
the one you can see the 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 white handkerchief embroidered in in red this is an article about precisely that that moment in in or that project about mending about embroidering the names of of the of the social leaders that have been murdered and so on so on so we've been collecting sort of a different different um different ways in which we are aware or are made aware of how threads and cloth and textiles occupy such a very important space in our life and how we've made them invisible. Thank you very much. Up next, we have Stephanie Bunn presenting Forces in Translation, the hidden story of mathematics and textile skills. Hello. Um, I'm going to talk about why textile practices are important for mathematics. And I'm arguing that textiles are important, not just because they're beautiful, or because of their contribution to culture and art, or because they act in regard to memory or identity, although they do all these things, but because the kinds of practical manipulative handwork we do when we make textiles are important for human cognitive development especially in the areas of spatial, spatial, of spatial understanding, geometry, and also to mathematical practices more broadly, such as counting, ordering, and pattern. Now, this is probably true for many other crafts, but what I'm saying here is that making textiles, whether basket weaving, making cordage, loom weaving, sewing, embroidery, knitting, crochet, lace making, and so on, are all activities for, which far from being obsolete in an age of dis digitization and virtual learning, in fact provide a strikingly important balance and supplement to the way we learn about space, geometry, and other mathematical practices. And my concern, and the concern of people I'm working with, who you can see here, um, on the Forces in Translation project, is that the increasing digitization of education which has certainly intensified since the COVID pandemic, alongside the streamlining of learning into easily accessible, quantifiable, measurable forms, such as multiple choice questions and very defined syllabuses, eliminates the opportunity to work with manipulative bodily skills and manual dexterity, to problem solve, to embody and embed complex mathematical problems, and to develop new and unanticipated innovative ways of approaching them. Indeed, the kinds of hand skills we might use to explore these kinds of questions are often considered obsolete or irrelevant. In this paper, I'm focusing particularly on basket work and our project focuses on basket work and related forms like knotting, twining, plaiting, coiling, braiding, uh, also cordage and looping. And it's based on research from our interdisciplinary research project, also called Forces in Translation. I'm an anthropologist and I work with uh, a mathematician, Ricardo Nemirovsky, who you can see there on the top right, and basket makers, Mary Crabb, Hilary Burns, Geraldine Jones, and also a person who's not here, an anthropologist of robotics, Katrina Haas. And what particularly interests us is the way that humans bodily, manually, intellectually, and socially come to understand geometric forms and problems through engaging with materials, using dexterous hand techniques to create a form which holds together into a container or a cord, a net or a mat of some kind. Key factors in many textile practices is that they're bilateral and bimanual, with the two hands working together in conjunction helping one another the whole time. They're repetitive, rhythmic, and critically, the maker will transfer attention between left and right. Textile practices are also gestural, and gesture, as educationists such as Susan Golden Meadow have argued, is one way to express a spatial understanding before even being able to articulate it. Such activities are important for attention development, spatial awareness and physical and cognitive development. Textile practices are also collaborative, socially textured and risky, and they link to the body in all sorts of ways. They require integrated 
body-mind practices, often within or between social groups, and they're intergenerational, so that learned skills move forward, developing and changing through time and through people. All these factors contribute to the rich social, practical and, and cultural environment required for the development of learning and needs further examination in the light of contemporary education, which tends to run counter to the valuing of hand skills. So um, what we can see is that working with materials and constructing form, we engage with forces and substances beyond the body, forces in materials, for example, <clears throat> and that through practice, we come to know the moves we can make and techniques we can use to work with these materials. And knowing this enables us to use the forces that emerge through our interaction with these materials to help construct form, pattern, structure. Now, by way of illustration about how I see this working, I turn to the work of anthropologist Gregory Bateson and also philosopher and phenomenologist Don Ede, both of whom talk of how through living and working in the world, we come to know through what Bateson describes as a circuit of mind, which extends beyond the body into materials and the tools. Now this image of a woman chopping wood is not of textiles, I know, but it's a very helpful illustration of how the process works, where body and tool become one. And the relationship between the hands, the body, the act, the acts, and the mind unite and act together to know just where and how to hit that block of wood so that it splits. So you have this whole circuit, which is kind of happening all at the same time. And you can equally see this in basketry. Just a quick demonstration. So many of these because I've never made this before. I'm not sure how um, the space them the, the, the idea of distance in the eye. Spaces. There's lots of stuff for the ride. So I'm hoping that I'll get to finish here. I'll get the other white gap there. Yeah. You've just got to get in. There's only I am. I'm trying to do it. So through, through this process, we come to know all manner of mathematical relationships, including spatial relationships, sequencing, rhythmic patterning, developing associative ideas, making connections and translating between different number bases. In a sense, the bodily resonance we experience working with the materials is reciprocal. What I mean is that it extends to the forces between us and the tools and devices we use in the material so that through applying basketry techniques with our hands, with bodkins or wrappers or knives and so on, we both bend the material and are bent by it. We leave it and are levered. So we, we make this connection with materials. I, I've lost count of the number of basket makers who say, I've never been any good at maths, but making baskets has helped me to see that I, I do have a mathematical side. But crafts such as basketry don't just help us embody mathematical understandings as I've been describing up to now. They can also extend them and expand them for mathematicians as well as textile makers. There are quite a few mathematicians who use textiles to illustrate mathematical problems. Platted basketry, for example, is very popular with computer modelers who develop digital models of platted baskets to explore questions of topology, the study of surfaces. So if I can illustrate this with an example, recently in our first studio trials, we explored what happens if you actually make what's called a skewed cube using, using platting technique as opposed to modeling it on a computer. So if you look at this example here, uh, if you look at this example here, uh, it's a very typical cube or, or this ex same example here. Um, <clears throat> it's made using platting in the diagonal way 45 degree angle. And what mathematicians are quite interested in is if you make a cube 
how can you tell where the different strands go and how they meet themselves. So they tend to draw everything out on graph paper, squared paper, and they've worked out that strands, some strands can just go around once, but if you have a, a cube that's on the skew, it's not exactly 45 degree angles, if that's a 45 degree version, that you might have, say, this black strand here is going up to here, and it's gonna go all the way around and all the way around several times. So if you skew your cube, you might get one band going around about three different times, or if you skew it a different amount, you might get it going around four times or, or even five. Now, Mary Crabb, one of our basket makers, realized that according to the angle of skew, so this is a skewed cube which has seven down one side and three down the other, as opposed to a direct diagonal going straight across the middle. So she, she worked out that um, if you, according to the angle of skew, there's rarely one solution as to which color strand might predominate if you get to the top of the cube. So here she, she's used alternate black and white on the base. She's worked her way up and here she's got to the top. But what she finds is, is that on one side, she's got a black or, or a red uh, coming through and the other side, it's meeting a strand of the opposite color. Now, what this means is you don't actually always get bands going all the way around uh, of the same color. You can actually make a decision about which one would happen. It's something you, you'd never encounter if you model this on a computer screen. And in fact, this feature of skewed cubes has never been raised by theoreticians or modelers, although people have written a huge amount of academic papers and mathematicians have about this very question. So, I hope I've explained it well enough for you to understand it, but basically what I'm saying is that pr as practitioners, we can begin to see some of the limitations of simply creating such forms on screens and alternatively the benefits that hands-on work could contribute to mathematical uh, methods. So similar questions arise in regard to materials. Modelers say things like, Imagine this basket is made from endless stainless steel strips. In other words, that it is totally neutral without properties, the materials from which it is made. And they would then go on to create images on the screen, um, which they would then try to transpose into reality or simply use it to demonstrate some kind of topological problem. But materials take up space and they also have properties. Some slide, some grip. Some act as filaments, as this straw here does. Others are flat. Um, and so as opposed to tension, which might be the prevailing force in willow, uh, flat pieces such as split cane or pandanus or rush, then friction becomes a key force. So you have different opposing forces, friction and tension. Some materials seem to have memories. Willow, for example, so if you bend it, it'll stay where it's put. Other materials like plastics and metal, uh, such as stainless steel wire, uh, will act quite differently. So materials can really affect how some kinds of structures work. And then you have techniques, which are also immensely subtle and wide ranging. And this brings us back really to the body and to the hands, adds to a great complexity. So just consider, for example, the subtlety or the subtle differences between knotting, plaiting, and Andean, Andean finger braiding, or sometimes called finger loop braiding. Um, so you can see here, on the left we have what we call a four plat. Here you can see perfectly well it has four sides, there are two of the sides. Just a subtle change of angle gives us eight sides. Very difficult to convey that in a diagram. So here's one set of, of demonstrations of a crown knot ostensibly exactly the same structure and the same process. Um, and here's a, another set of instructions for the same so-called knot again. This, and um, when you see the actual um, braid made from it, just because it has the angles at a slightly different direction, it tends to lead the maker to make it in a slightly different form. So, and then just to really add to the confusion, the windmill knot, which some people may know, instead of making, again, a very, very similar, very closely woven knot, but instead of making 
uh, the pattern in a kind of vertical uh, line, it suddenly makes it out into a surface. And these variations are caused by very subtle differences of finger movement and hand pressure. Yet if you just followed a diagram, you wouldn't necessarily know how significantly the outcome might be. Now this um, brings me to another point, just another brief, very simple example, if anyone else is into knotting. Um, the sheep bend knot, which um, basically, according to just how much pressure you put on that knot, if you want to do it correctly, the right way, you end up with something which makes a really effective fishing net and holds it together to catch loads of fish. If you do it the wrong way and just pull it too tight, then suddenly the knot slips out and you, and you end up with what a fisherman calls a useless knot. And um, uh, this brings me to diagrams uh, for mathematicians. Diagrams are considered part of their toolkit, part of the materiality of mathematics as much as a tool for them as a ruler or a compass. In a sense, diagrams show us that mathematics is actually not really entirely abstract. Diagrams accompany their thinking. Uh, it's a process that has a kind of material labor. Now, textile workers also uh, use diagrams, uh, such as those in how-to books. Yet the diagrams in the how-to books are very different from those of the mathematician, and mathematicians wouldn't necessarily accord them the same kind of intellectual value. So if you closely look at these two different diagrams, on the left is a, a diagram from a classic weaving book, which explains to you four aspects of, of, of trying to set up a weaving loom, in fact. Um, the fact that you have, to, you have a diagram for um, <clears throat> how to set up the walk, a, 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 a draft or a diagram of the, how to tie up the shafts, a draft of the treadling order, and even a draft of the actual representation of the cloth to be woven. And again, ironically, mathematicians, a very famous mathematical paper by these two people, Grumbaum and Shepherd, to, has taken just one diagram of this process, the, basically the finished piece, and has linked it as a, as a system for exploring a specific mathematical problem yet without understanding the other aspects of the process which you, uh, are actually explaining people how to do it. So you end up with this paper which is just incredibly restricted, which could actually tell us a lot more. Now just to sort of cut, draw myself to a conclusion, um, I'll miss out that one. We're not the first researchers to draw parallels between textile techniques and how they work to mathematical problems. Paulus Gerdes, for example, did huge work on African plaited basketry, exploring the geometric forms and problems they relate to. There's also a whole area of ethnomathematics and textiles from work with kipu knots for creating tallies um, to things like the drawings in Vanuatu from Malakula, thanks, um, uh, documented by Deacon, uh, and also kind of uh, recent textile people such as Mary Harris and Ellen Harlesius Kluck have also done a lot of work linking and showing how textiles relate to mathematics. But I hope in our project, uh, and perhaps what I hope is, that, is the difference, is that we've not set out simply to highlight the limitations that textile practices can reveal about mathematical analysis. What we're interested in is just showing what they can contribute and in what my collaborator calls continuities between mathematics and textiles. And above all, we're interested in acknowledging the importance of all aspects of practice, whether in textiles where patterns may be made by eye or involve skills like estimation and thinking in different number bases or in mathematics, uh, which our mathematical colleagues assure us is never purely abstract, but does involve many real world practices. Nevertheless, it is provocative to think about what a, what a mathematics might look like which took textile practice as one of its starting points, especially if these included textiles from the Andes or Vanuatu, Mozambique, Borneo and elsewhere. We might then come up with a, not a simple, simply different approach to mathematics, but even a different kind of mathematics as well. Thank you. And so with that, um, this is a Q&A portion. So for all the attendees, if there's any questions that you'd like to ask the panelists, please enter them into the Q&A and then we'll address them. And if I could ask all of the panelists to turn their videos back on. Um, great, okay. So um, the first question that we have 
is from Kate and it's for Sarah Joy. Um, she says, after hearing Sarah Joy comment about the asterisks in WordPress software acting as um, a subtle or a symbol of erasure, I'm wondering if specific embroidery stitches carry a similar ability to hold symbolic meaning. I'm curious to know about the stitches you use in your work and if you've considered the, the potential symbols within these stitch types. Yeah, I love that question. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, I have. And uh, when you're talking about buttonholes, my first thing is jumping to um, my supervisor, Alice Kettles, always talking about Maxine Bristow's work and the use of the cut. So it's something that's been floating around uh, that idea of the buttonhole. Um, but I, so I create all my embroideries pretty much in um, Ethos software, which is an industrial embroidery software. And um, it, I think it has a lot of different fun stitch types. And I have been thinking about the symbolism, but I think at the moment it's a lot about taking that industrial software that's meant to create kind of, um, you know, objects to sell for commercial purposes and playing and disrupting it. So I do a lot of work with rearranging and pulling out stitches and dragging and kind of disrupting the way that I use the software and that has a kind of symbolism in it um, but it also has functions to create your own stitches um, which is quite complicated and I, I've been I want to go back to the software team and talk about creating my own stitches with tiny labrises when I tried to do it the machine just had an absolute nope uh, but I think there is a way of of, of getting there so um, yeah thank you for that um, I hope that answers your question a little bit thank you <laughs> and sparks some new areas for exploration for you right um the next two are actually for stephanie and they're not really questions so much as comments um about other uses of mathematics and textiles so the crocheted hyperbolic plane um is one that sarah suggested and then uh elena says um she wants to know if you're familiar with the work of veronica irvine irvine Sorry, excuse me, a lace maker and mathematician. So just some resources for you to also check out. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's great. I'm going to say, I, I personally am obsessed with baskets, so you'll be finding me on your doorstep in the not too distant future. <laughs> but it is, I actually, since we are waiting for questions, and again, please, to the audience, we'd love to hear what you have to say and the questions you have, um, that oftentimes basketry is sort of relegated to this um, second class citizen standard within textiles. Of course, I'm sure I'm about to get a ton of hate mail for saying that. But, um, you know, as someone who, speaking from my personal experience, has experience making basketry, loves basketry, um, that sometimes it's not taken as seriously as other textile arts. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that or if that's just my own perceived bias. No, I think there's an element of that which is true. Um, and it's quite interesting because, in fact, you, the one thing that you, one kind of textile you can't make by a machine, by a machine is a basket. Um, you can make, you know, and it's ironic in a way. There's a divergence between, say, basketry and weaving, um, where you, you, you weaving has led to the development of the loom, which ultimately has been kind of linked to the development of, um, of computer programming and digitizing things. Um, whereas the basket, you, you cannot make it. Um, uh, by machine and in a way that's what makes it very interesting because it's so manipulable and, and it involves your hands so much you, you have to keep going back to making with your hands. Yeah the human body is actually the primary tool involved. Absolutely yeah. Um, but yeah. I I no I, I also um, sent Stephanie a message but I'm thinking that she might not be able to see it or she might not see it is that also there's the the you know in in Baldorf schools or in that methodology they also teach kids to math through knitting my daughters have learned math through knitting so it's also interesting to to explore not also you know western ways of introducing math and knitting to the curriculum. Yeah thank you for that um do any of the panelists, do any of you have questions for any of your fellow panelists? I have a question for, for Sarah. Uh, 
you're, you're doing your PhD research and you're obviously um, um, a maker as well. Um, it, with this idea of, of, you know, what we value as, as a product of, of research, have you encountered um, that throughout your research um, process or your PhD? Are these quilts that you're making um, also a product that you're going to hand in or they're just um, something that hangs on the side of your work? How have you combined the both, both? Um, the making and and the writing or the research. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's um is a complicated one, and it took me a long time to figure it out. So here in the UK, we have um, practice based PhDs. Um, so I'm doing one of those, and it essentially means you hand in a body of made stuff and um, a thesis that's essentially half the length. But in a way, it's so much harder because you've got to get to grips with that synthesis between research and practice and what it means to do research through practice and to encounter new knowledge through making, then synthesize that and write it in half the words. Like, it's like, oh, I'm like dreading this word count situation completely. Um, but it, yeah, so the practice is always coming first and it's been a process of learning. I always used to, I love writing and I was already doing sort of presentations and things before my PhD and trying to somehow grapple with that. But I always made the mistake of sort of listing the context and then talking about my practice. And it's a it's a sort of physical and mental rearranging of being like, take the practice from here and put it back on top. Like, and always like kind of, put it first and that's been like something that's really like helped me work through the notion of what that means but it yeah I mean trying to explain my PhD to people it, oh yeah no, it's, it's difficult <laughs> I think that it, it, yeah, you have to translate from one medium to the other and it's not necessarily something that translates very easily so it's 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 I find it very complicated I mean yeah. I welcome those kind of PhDs but at the same time having to translate seems yeah. a bit um, strange especially because we are saying these are other forms of not of producing knowledge that are important and yet we have to submit the written form yeah so it's like we cannot let go of those other forms well I see it as a loop I don't see it as like originally I used to think oh right I'm explaining it but I'm not explaining it it feeds each other so I very much invested in this auto ethnography and my thesis is focused on the affects of the lesbian archive and encountering it so by writing my experience it feeds straight back into the quilt and it's definitely more of a loop and I wouldn't be able to make the quilts that I'm making without the reflective writing space of the autoethnography which I guess is kind of what I'm working through almost in this paper was trying to yeah kind of get to grips with that um yeah synthesis but I definitely don't I, I love the writing and I don't I see it as a yeah I see it as part of a, a of a, pra a whole practice rather than a um, but yeah, it's a, a separate one. Yeah. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you, guys. Um, we have a question from an anonymous attendee for all the panelists. I hear a lot about I hear a lot about community in your talks. Excuse me. Can any of you speak more about community or how the people that surround you impact your process of making? Is there anyone who'd like to start? Um, I would like to start. Yeah. So, well, I'm just going to speak to the, what I've been doing this summer in light of the Breonna Taylor and the political injustices that have been happening. But I was thinking about how do I bring art to my community? Cause I focus so much on the fine art and in a way it can be very abstract at times. So I was wondering how do I bring light to these spaces and involve the people closest to me who are actually going through the same things that I'm going through and how to kind of build a community around making, thinking, crafting. Cause a lot of these performances happen with my family and friends and us gathering together and putting what we had to just go out there for an hour to a spot that I had chosen because I lived there but kind of existed within the realm of these spaces that, you know, 
were very contested or that where the sites actually happened. So it's, I just feel that reaching out for what, you know, I just start with people who are near and then they, you trust that people are willing to go out and, you know, support you. And I think it's just believing in the people who are around you, honestly, and then giving them a chance to, you know, blossom with the material that you have. So I think that's how I can speak to community. Yeah. I suppose, you know, I could say a word about this spurious kind of community that exists on social media. I mean, we're all existing online in many ways at the moment, but, um, you know, visible mending as such as been spreading largely through sharing on one app in particular you know which one is Instagram so is that community I mean I'd love to know what you all think is that community it doesn't really feel like community but sometimes it does it actually really genuinely can feel real but is it you know when I'm doing um groups and teaching and such in the real world as I used to that is a very different idea when it comes to a tactile textile intervention and just doing you know, the old stitch and bitch I really don't like that term because what's bitchy about it and anyway getting together is not that's real community so can what do you all think can we do that on Instagram in the meantime while we can't really gather in groups um, I think just like quickly on that social media thing, something I've noticed in my research, especially with the Rebel Dykes, is that these communities that kind of floated apart, which like have come back together. There's a secret like Facebook group, which I was very kindly let in of um, Rebel Dykes. And the stuff on there is amazing. It's great for me to be able to see it. And, the, the, and there's a lot of people finding each other through these networks and the same from the lesbians that I've worked from, uh, worked with in the States as well. They've all got these kind of amazing networks of connection where they're finding people who were lost. Um, and that's been a huge, um, yeah, it's amazing. So I guess swings and roundabouts, doesn't it? <laughs> That's yeah, I, gu I guess it depends on how on how how lucky uh, you are to be able to actually meet with people um, and and build a different kind of community. I remember um, when the postpartum depression that I had with my first daughter, it was very important for me to meet a community of mothers online who were going, who were able to speak about that openly. Um, and also, we are not many. Not, this is my first presentation on a textile exclusive uh, panel. I presented in in anthropology congresses and whatnot. So. Um, because there are not many those kind of panel uh, congresses here in Colombia. So also being able to get to know your work or through Instagram, it's also very important. Um, so I understand what, that it seems that is a community that is not palpable and when you work with textiles you want to touch and something that that one feels drawn to. Um, but it's yet I think a very important community and also a uh, Somebody asked about about a question about to, in in the in the Q and A as well about um, the community that that one built. I mean, basically, when we're I'm talking about collective uh, making of textiles, and that's different. There's one thing about the community that gets together around making each of its own, and there's one thing that about getting together a make and working in the same collective piece. So there are two different things as well. Thank you for that. The next question is for Anika. So much of what, and this is, um, they say so much of what you're researching in your own work and others is ephemeral or lost or erased. Can you speak about materializing, carrying the ephemeral into the future? Mm, that's a good question. <laughs> um, carrying the ephemeral into the future. Okay, so... Yeah, I think that's kind of where I'm working with now in terms of sound and digital and how that kind of connects to corn rolling or braiding. And because everything is so much going online, I kind of wonder, that's what I was speaking about. Like, I want to hold on to that physical connection since everything is becoming so digitized and we hear so many things that are happening like with technology like within the next 50 years and it's it's kind 
And it's scary to feel that you could lose that like wholeness or that physical. But um, I feel like uh, Stephanie was saying, I know that uh, like there are certain things that you have to do with the hand that you that will always last. And I feel like a braiding practice is one of them that I, I don't ever see that being autom like automated but I, I don't know, but I'm just going to carry that into the future and see where it takes me. <laughs> well, I guess with that, actually, then we'll just end. And thank you so much to all the panelists for your wonderful presentations, for your hard work and your research, and for being here with us from very many different locations and time zones. And so thank you for that. And then to all the attendees, thank you for your time and attention and for your thoughtful questions and being here with us. So. Thank you again and have a good rest of your afternoon.